Internet, riddle me this. Does a player who receives a minimal amount of screen time deserve to be portrayed as such? What if said player was integral to the dynamics of a season, held influence in the tribe, and partook in several big moves, but none of it was shown? Can we say it ever happened? Does a poor edit explain itself? And if not, where do we draw the line? Pretty on this way too many questions. Ah, philosophy. You make my head hurt. It's like the ship of Theseus. If you gradually replace all the parts to a ship, is it still the same ship? In a similar vein, the word deserved is loaded and subjective and absolutely up for debate. On one hand, if you saw Courtney Yates first on season 20 Heroes vs. Villains, you might think that she's a nobody. How did she even get cast in the first place? Barely any screen time, a few comments here or there about Russell, but like, she clearly lacked charisma or a worthy game or a relevant story or whatever. She just didn't have what it took to be aired in the episodes, right? I mean, let's just be honest. She probably didn't give great confessionals, at least not in the eyes of the producers. Except, of course, I refer back to season 15 China, five seasons prior, where she was a show stealer and one of the focal points of the entire season. The runner-up who nearly won and even won a whole ass individual immunity challenge sitting on her ass, something Jean Robert never did. And not for nothing, she's one of my personal favorites. You kind of see where I'm going with this. The same person fits two separate labels, and it could be argued, wait for it, that both sides have a point. In one season, Courtney is a main character who delivers one-liners and zingers and oftentimes steals the spotlight, is super memorable, easily deserves a spot as a top five female villain in the show's history, and then, in the next, she's reduced to being near invisible, irrelevant, and woefully under-edited. And here's the kicker. My example with Courtney applies to pretty much every player. When someone is under-edited, barely talks, doesn't get much screen time, doesn't talk to the audience much in private confessionals, I always kinda wonder why. What's up that left them so destitute in the edit? I decided to dive a little deeper and see if I could find several players who, unlike Courtney on season 20, went deeper into a season, maybe even reached the finale, maybe even nearly won the game, and yet, we're still barely featured on the show. You know, some of these players probably played better games than we realized, some just needed more screen time for the sake of it, but either way, without further ado, here are my top five Survivor players who deserved a better edit. I say top five, there isn't really an order here, but if I had to start somewhere, I'm gonna go with an easy one and put into question why Mike Tice, sorry, Brett from season 19 Samoa didn't get more airtime. You might not remember this guy, and if you don't, I don't blame you, but he was actually the first person from the entire cast to talk to the cameras in the premiere episode. As the players are paddling in, we get to see the cast of this season for the first time. We get to see Brett for the first time, and possibly the last. This lady with her free-flowing loa, she's probably some super outdoors woman that will naturally set forth as our leader. I understand that Brett is a part of the dominant purple Galu tribe who won most of the pre-merge immunities, never went to tribal council, and then at the merge were decimated by their own follies, but what I don't get is why Brett needed to be so hidden from the narrative for so long. He was nearly invisible for 90% of this season. He really only emerges in the final few episodes to pose as a challenge threat and obstacle for the FOA FOA 4 alliance. We didn't know anything about the guy, except that he always had a smile on his face and apparently everyone on his tribe really liked him and he would have swept the jury if he won that final challenge. We saw him bond with Natalie over their religion, but otherwise, that's it. He was the last big hurdle for the foe of foes to clear, and they almost didn't. They were almost stopped by this goober. And wouldn't it have made for a better ending if we actually gave a shit about him at all? If we knew anything about him whatsoever. Much of the glue screen time was devoted to Russell Swan, to Shambo, and Laura, yet Brett had the best social game of them all, was one challenge away from winning it all, and like, 
how obvious is it that he is not gonna win when you jokingly wonder if he was digitally added into this season at the end? This guy has to be CGI, right? And like just right there, that recurring joke is born out of what I believe is an undeserved bad edit for someone who deserved better. So you telling me he's all of a sudden Superman because he wins two? He, he's not some superstar to me. You start thinking that, you start getting weak in the mind, thinking you can't beat him like he's stepping in the ring with Mike Tyson. He's no Mike Tyson. He's Brett. Speaking of fourth placers who nearly could have won, a more recent addition to this lineup is Heather from Survivor 41. And look, I know Erica was the front runner and probably still wins if Heather beats Deshaun in the fire making challenge, but I bet Heather gets more votes than Deshaun did, or Xander for that matter, oop. And that's probably shocking to hear if you didn't dive deeper into the social dynamics of this season. Because so much of this season's edit was obscured and hidden for whatever reason, Erica's relationships were played down to prop up several others, and really, the biggest kicker here is just how much time is devoted to players who found advantages. That was the true theme of this season, and Heather just wasn't involved despite nearly reaching the final tribal and having a fighting chance to win. And you don't have to take my word for it, Heather literally asked the casting director herself in the middle of this season about why her presence was so downplayed. Did the producers not like her? Did she do something wrong? Did she kick Jeff Probst's puppy? From what she was told, it was mostly because she didn't find any advantages all season. That was it. That was the focus. I'm honestly embarrassed to know that that's the reason. And yet, it also makes sense if you recall the season, because you wouldn't recall how Erica and Heather linked up right away once they hit the beach, or how Deshaun told Heather all about his truth bombs against Erica before that tribal because Heather had a great relationship with Deshaun all season. Or how Ricard loved Heather and would have voted for her had she reached the final three. Or what about when Heather put a target on Sydney over a dream? The best we got from her was when she failed a challenge in the pre-merge and tried to blow up a tribal early in the merge. She was one of the most important cogs in the wheel of the season from all of the power players. Look at her connections, look who I'm talking about. And yet she wasn't fleshed out because she didn't find a trinket in the jungle. I got to this point and I'm proud of myself and I overcame a lot of fears um, most people don't know about. Um, I almost drowned when I was younger and I didn't get in the water for 35 years. And so when these challenges came up where I had to run and jump off this you know, giant structure into the water, I was petrified. But when I did it, I felt like I grew another inch that day. So this pushed me way beyond my comfort zone, and I was proud of how I've progressed, and I'm thankful for this journey. When it comes to cold hard data, lots of superfans have tracked all sorts of statistics, from confessional count to time spent per episode speaking to tribal council questions. And from a long while ago, the name of the invisible game was dubbed Purple, after Purple Kelly Shin with purple in her hair from season 21, Nicaragua. She quit the game halfway through and was scorned with a bad edit as punishment by the producers after the fact. And from there on out, any player who was nearly as invisible was coined Purple because of Kelly, because of that purple hair. Or retroactively in the case of Purple Brett, who literally wore purple. He also was a t-shirt designer. Heather was another bad case of the purple, and while Purple Kelly is worthy of being on this list just for the sheer meagerness of her edit, her lack of talking was literally a joke on this season from the editors, Jesus Christ. You never talk, really. I know, it's kind of funny, huh? Weird. It wasn't until season 36, Ghost Island, that another player would not only rival but surpass Kelly's purpleness with an even worse edit than hers from a player who made it even further. I'm sitting. Chelsea Townsend was also coincidentally on the Purple Navidi tribe, and she was totally invisible on this season, matching the low performing numbers of Purple Kelly. Only Chelsea made it further, eighth place. And from everything I've heard, she was a much bigger presence on this season than you would ever know. Listening to Dom, Wendell, 
Kellen. Several of her original trimates talk about Chelsea after the season. It was revealed how integral she was to their power structure and the game overall. Chelsea was Dom's first ally on the season, from day one, before even Wendell, and she was pivotal to his early game and the tribe's makeup. At that second swap, when Bradley was blindsided, it was Chelsea and Dom who came up with the strategy to throw the challenge to take out Bradley, an original Navidi, before he became too powerful at the merge. Chelsea was also in good with Dez, with Kellen, with several of the women, and that's why she was spared in the early merge from being targeted. Dom and Wendell even said that Chelsea was one of their biggest threats to gaining a foothold on the endgame, and it was when she was voted out at the final eight that Dom made his biggest mistake by cutting her too soon. Even more juicy than that, however, despite her strong relationship with Dom, she voted for Wendell to win in the 5-5 jury split because she went into that final tribal ready to vote for Dom, only for him to totally whiff on her jury question. Rarely does that happen in Survivor, where a juror changes their vote at the final tribal council, and yet we wouldn't know any of this because None of it was on the season at all. Her final travel question was cut. Her entire story was cut. Her presence was cut. And I would say undeservedly. All because, from what I've gathered, she likely shared a similar narrative to Kellen, who posed as a better narrator from the same original tribe. Screen time is a fickle beast. Chelsea was my girl who we'd check in, I, you know, her and I would check in every few days. And I haven't seen her for six or seven days at this point, so... We had a lot to catch up on. But Chelsea and I already started the planning for the throwing of the challenge to get rid of Bradley. You felt like that uh, taking Chelsea out so early ended up being a bad move for you. Absolutely. And that where I didn't defend her and keep her in the game longer is I, I think that combined with Wendell's social game you know, put them together and that equals a, a not vote for Dom. You know what's also a fickle beast? Being the second best challenge beast of your season, being one vote away from winning the game, being a super fan who was on the online forums before they were even popular and being a mom. Well, oh, hold on. Actually, I don't think any of those are fickle, but regardless, Jesusita Susie Smith deserves a little more credit for her game on arguably the sloppiest season of all time. Enter season 17, Survivor Gabon. Susie shows up, is third pick for her tribe, a total steal in the draft. She links up with the majority alliance on Fong early on, gets a bad swap, but you know what? Overtakes Dan, nothing to it, hits the second swap, and makes the biggest move of the season, bar none, by voting out Marcus, the golden boy, and then sweeps the post-merge in the majority, working alongside her number one ally from day one in Maddie. She stops Bob, the challenge beast, dead in his tracks at the final four, where it mattered most. Susie hit the season running from the beginning and was totally ignored for much of it in the edit, despite being one vote away from being the sole survivor. Was Susie the greatest player ever? Debatably no. Were her three votes to win a total shocker, possibly the most of any runner-up? Debatably, yes. And that's kind of sad, given I think there's an argument for her having played the best game of the season, albeit on Gabon, so take that for what it's worth, and barely anyone gets that because the edit either ignores her in favor of making Bob into the All-American Boy Scout, or it just shows her worst moments to make her look worse than Bob because ultimately he wins and the editors were scrambling to make him into a worthy winner when he played one of the worst winning games ever. And that's not a hot take. Susie's game wasn't flashy, nor was it intended to make for the best TV, but it was solid when it came to reaching the end and potentially winning. And I would argue her reputation as a runner-up deserves a little more respect from the edit. You start to watch enough seasons and you may notice that second placers tend to look worse for wear to bolster the winner, make them shine a little brighter, go down easier for the audience as the victor. And I'm sure Susie was a victim of that recurring narrative narrative. Again, she wasn't perfect, but hell, nobody on Gabon was, and maybe it's finally time she got her flowers for like half a second. It was her decision to flip that allowed the original Fong to go on their improbable run. She's considered weak at individual challenges, yet she's already won a big one. Day one, I wasn't confident, but day 39, I am very confident, and I feel very comfortable telling you guys that. Susie, 
You and I were friends from day one, and we were friends on day 39. Spend it wisely. Last but not least for this group of five, let's talk about a more recent endgame player from season 37, David vs. Goliath. I am talking about Dr. Allison. Again, like a lot of these players, you might not remember her as well compared to, say, Christian or Mike White, Angelina, Nick, Davey, Gabby, you know, a pretty strong cast of characters and players. And that's because Allison was largely edited to a minimum despite being a strong core player of this season who made it all the way to the finale and landed in fifth and was the front runner to win the game had Mike not turned on her at the last second. Allison had a strong bond with Alec, Mike, Kara, Gabby, was in a friends turned enemy situation with Angelina and loosely worked with Christian too. She was in good with the Goliaths and even beat all of them, the entire merge cast, at the first immunity challenge. She was dubbed a challenge beast and had a target on her back. She was a huge social threat, incredibly smart. Everyone always had her name in their mouth and she was the main target from the final nine to the final five. Five straight votes, she was the target, and she survived four of them. And what do we have to show for that? What did she get? The weakest edit of the cast relative to placement, despite being the front runner to win going into the finale. Look, was she a big character? Maybe the editors didn't see the potential compared to the other players, but a lot of her bonds and moves were left on the cutting room floor, and it's unfortunate, and I think it's because she didn't fit into the usual narrative a woman might find themselves. She didn't check the boxes as a flirt, or as bossy, or as wacky and out there. She wasn't overly emotional or petty. She wasn't the leader. She was just a strong person and player, and on another season likely could have won. Her inspiration was Kim Spradlin, and she was compared to Kim on this season, which is a pretty big target to shake. Her name kept coming up, largely thanks to Mike, and her target grew and grew with each vote she survived. But the story just didn't follow that. The story never focused on her at all, despite the reality of what was actually happening. I'm also going to hazard a guess and say being a Goliath didn't help either, as they were the villains by default, and who wants a sympathetic villain? Complexity in my shows? No thank you. Because Allison was anything but a villain, she was kinda actually villainized by the end with how Angelina and Mike treated her. And hey, maybe she deserved a little more than that. Allison is going home tonight, and I'm feeling a little naughty. Um, maybe borderline evil, maybe borderline mean girl. I mean, I, to me, it's like, I think there's something great about, you know, leaving it all out on the island, and then there's also leaving with a shred of dignity. For me, trying to play an all-out game is me losing dignity or losing pride. And his relationship is arguably one of the ones I've valued the most out here. Yeah, whatever. I was on the edge of leaving for five triple councils, and you can only chase away the Grim Reaper for so long. And those are five Survivor players who I believe deserved a better edit than they got. And believe me, there are more players out there who I could talk about. I know the alumni are just lining up to get into my DMs, but maybe I will save them for another video in the future. Either way, let me know who you think should have received a better edit and why, as well as what you think about these players. A huge thank you to my patrons for all your support. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to burn your buff in the fire in dramatic fashion on your way out, just, you know, for a little more screen time, and I will see you in the next one. Once I appeal to the past editing teams for a recut on all of these seasons. <laughs> I have a dream. I came to my house and stole my torch. <laughs> I listened to my dreams. Heather, she has this premonition that I'm gunning for her. Now she's gonna try to gun for me because of a freaking dream. I made it up. I absolutely am targeting Sydney. I made up that dream completely because in my gut I don't trust Sydney. So I used my not real dream to kind of say something sparked something in me you know i don't know is the universe trying to tell me something and hopefully others will see it too and feel it too and just want that energy out of there if her dream got me out oh my god i would be seventh person voted out of survivor 41. sydney sydney tribe's fucking